give you another example. So I did the rehabilitation for Kevin Durant for his ruptured Achilles, right? So you've got a guy who's top of the game, plays basketball at the top level, ruptured his Achilles. He's 30 plus years old. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And today we have Dr. Dave Hancock, who is a physio and we were talking off air. I am blown away that we have this guest, um, Dr. Dave, uh, Dr. Hancock. I am very appreciative of you coming on the show. Please introduce yourself to our members and our listeners out there. And I look forward to getting to learn from you, man. Justin, pleasure. Um, please just call me Dave. Do. <laughs> we don't need we'll to do. be for- we don't need to be formal here. We'll um, nice to be on the show and uh, nice to chew the fat. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, we talked on the phone beforehand, and I think this is going to be something that we're going to be able to help strength coaches out with right away. The gap between athletic training, strength and conditioning, fit like it exists. How do we fix it? So I think the first thing is communication. I think it's really important. Um, so my background is I'm a DPT, uh, CSCS strength coach, being a performance director. Um, I was the performance director at the Knicks for seven years. I was on the Nike performance board. I worked in the Premier League for 18 years. I worked for Chelsea, um, Leeds, Wolves. And then I also worked for the England national team. So for the past 30 years, I've sort of been around this whole performance, sports medicine, injury prevention um, cycle. And I feel the first thing I, I see is communication between departments has to be there. The way that I look at this, right, is that if I'm a strength coach working for an organization, whether it's a professional collegiate high school, I'm there to improve the performance of my ath- or our athletes. And that's the goal to uh, improve their power, improve their strength, improve their speed, improve their ability to perform their sport at the highest level and go on and beyond. But another component of that is that I'm also responsible to make sure that they're available to do that because no matter what you do in a weight room or what you do on a field, if the individual isn't available to play, it's, it's worthless. So I feel What's really important here is that communication between the athletic training staff and the strength coaches. And I also think what's really important here is looking at your availability stats, right? Look at your trends of what your data tells you. So there's a big occurrence that's happening, for instance, in the NFL now. If you look at the NFL data, hamstring injuries are becoming like an absolute cancer. And the question is, is all right, so let's say I'm working in the NFL, what am I doing as a strength coach to prevent hamstrings? And it's not just a question of, well, we do loads of Nordics. It's a question of, it's a question of what each of those individuals need and what you look at within that individual to actually prevent in your department, as well as the athletic training department. And I think that's where those two silos, if you like, need to come together. How do we do that? Because there there are silos, but then there is, is it just getting rid of ego? Because <clears throat> my drug of choice when I was at Towson was my head athletic trainer, Kyle Cherry. He and I were yin and yang. We worked together amazingly, and I've loved being able to work with him. It's not like that everywhere, and I'm guessing it's mm. simply ego? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, right, you're there to do a job for the athlete. Yes, that's, right. what, that's what we're there for. So, we're there for the that, effort. That, you, you know, you can be on a touchline, you can be on a bench. You know, I've, I've personally done all that stuff, but you're actually there for the athlete. That's what you're paid for. And you're there to enhance the athlete in so many ways, physically, mentally, um, support, depending on whatever level you are. It's no different. Um, and therefore... This whole component about availability and and injury prevention is absolute key. Um, 
What's up, Strength Coaches? Taking a quick break away from the show to let you know about our membership site. Not only do we at Strength Coach Network put out the Cheeky Midweeky, but we have a membership site where you gain access to a video library and a members-only forum. Inside the video library, you will have access to over 170 different lectures, which equals over 400 hours of content. Inside of these content, it is every sport you could think of and every topic in strength and conditioning. In our members-only forum, we have career advice and we have topics in strength and conditioning where coaches ask each other questions and we help each other inside the network. You can try the network out for 24 hours for $1 if you are not a member. Click the link down below and you will be able to check us out. Um... I think the key is that you're there for the athlete and that availability is really important. So as part of your program, prevention needs to be part of your program. And it's not just about making the athlete robust because obviously that is hugely important. And I completely agree with any strength coach that talks about robustness because it is about robustness and however you do that. And we can go on to the fine details about opinions about robustness, but each of those individual athletes needs something different. And I think you should look at what they do from a player position perspective and relay that into whatever you're doing in your programs. I think what I've seen a lot of, even across like the professional world from NBA, NFL, MLB, there's a lot of blanket programs. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're in the phase of power. We're in the phase of hypertrophy. We're in the phase of strength. We're in, you know, lower body, upper body, whatever you're putting into play. But there's more to it than that. And I think that the the specifics of the player position and the past medical history has to play a point in what you're doing on the development of the athlete. Amen to that 100%. Because what you just said about like, oh, power phase, hypertrophy phase, you can't ever neglect a certain aspect, especially within team sports. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I understand that you're limited in the time that you have to spend with athletes. But <clears throat> I really believe that there should be some element of injury prevention into your program for that individual athlete. How do you go about that? Uh, you, for you, with the word injury prevention, what it what do you mean by preventing it? Because I know, like, that's something that we talk about here a decent amount. Yeah. So, you know, listen, it depends on your skill level, right? And it depends on how you're looking at this. Okay. On a real basic level, if I was going to start from scratch with a blank piece of paper, I'd look at all the injuries that the individuals had. So, let's say, for instance, you've had someone who's had an ankle problem. Let's say, for instance, you've got another athlete who's had a hamstring tear or quad tear. Let's say, for instance, you've got another athlete who's had an ACL. Right? They're all different. Yep. So in my program for the ankle would be some single leg work, which would improve proprioception. And that might be RDLs. So there'd be more emphasis to that athlete on single leg proprioceptive work. Let's talk about the hamstring person. So that might be eccentric Nordics. It might also be, can they control their pelvis uh, and stabilize the pelvis and flex and move their hip? Um, Can they do single leg uh, bridge work, controlling their pelvis? And when you're looking at that, it might be more around not just purely emphasizing the hamstring, but looking at, for instance, the hip and the pelvis and looking at, say, obliques. And can they control the pelvis when you do a single leg bridge? Can they do fallout? Can they basically go up into a bridge and abduct their hip and bring it back in again, controlling their pelvis? Because the joints above and the joints below need to stabilize to allow something to mobilize. That's how the body works. Mm -hmm. So on a real basic level, it's things like that that you should emphasize. The ACL would incorporate probably to both of those, would incorporate hamstring work because we know that hamstring work helps with regard ACLs. It might incorporate balance and control, deceleration work. So it might include some plyo type work for that particular athlete, whether that's in the phase of the training that you're doing or whether that's actually in the part of the prep or the warm up. So there's three examples on a real basic level where each of those three athletes programs should be slightly different to what your main phase of what you're trying to achieve does. And you can include that. So if you're in power phase, you can include that in the hamstring, in the balance, in the RDLs, in the jumps, in the decelerations for those individual athletes. 
And that's the bit I don't see happening, right? And that's the bit where I'm like, why on earth aren't these silos on the same page for the individual athlete? Because all of those things that I talked to you about can massively improve the performance of the individual. If you've had an injury, that is going to delay or cause a mechanical change or cause an insufficiency in movement for whatever sport they do. And basically, we're born to move. I couldn't agree with you more. And I don't know. I guess I... I guess I selfishly assume that everybody is collaborating because that's what I did. And that's what other, the coaches that I, or the athletic trainer that I worked with, because that is at the end of the day, what it's about everything that you just said. And I remember a conversation I had with, he's not even a colleague. He's just a friend that we never worked together. He's now in the NFL. And he was talking about how kind of like what you were saying. He's like, you know, these coaches talk about how, they brag that they're a football only, so they have the only sport to work with, but yet they don't spend the time to actually truly individualize, and you don't have to overly tweak every little single thing. Like You could keep the same main movement, and maybe the sets and reps are different, but you can find a way to work and help the individual within a team setting, and that stuck with me. And hearing you say that just further cements the fact that we can do that, and that's what we need to be educating strength coaches to be doing right now. Yeah, I I agree. And listen, I get it, right? You have 60 or 70 guys coming into a weight room and you've got two hours and that's it. So it's it's really difficult to manage that amount of people coming through. It's not like, let's not give them a cop out. (laughs) Well, well, I mean, look, I think this is about like creation of your programs and being specific within those programs. And I think if you plan it's it's just it's quite simple to do and i'm not talking about you have to completely revamp what your program is i'm talking about like in between it might be if you're working in a if you're working in a rack between four four guys and they're coming through the rack right it might be you know when you rest you stand and do this bosu work or you stand and do you know single leg rdls or you just stand on one leg and close your eyes and move your legs whatever it would be there's some input that can happen in the weight room that can complement what happens in the training room. Because believe me, right, we're having this conversation about strength coaches. It's exactly the same in the, in the training room, right? You, they think that this is happening in the training room. And, and the same scenario, you've got an athletic trainer that might be seeing 25, 30 athletes a day, not necessarily monitoring what is actually going on on those individual programs. The same as what we're talking about with the strength coach. So the complement of both silos, both departments working in fluency, can, in my opinion, can help that athlete and help that athlete stay on the court, the field, in the pool, whatever they're doing. This just this thought literally just came to me hearing you say that. What if there was no different rooms? What if the weight room and the athletic training room were the I mean, these massive palaces that are being built. What if they were just in the same and everybody had the same office? They had their own different office space within that big weight room, but there was actually no division of doors. Do you think that'll help? I do, but I think the first thing that I would be looking at, right, would be, at the end of the day, it's all about wins and losses, right? That's what everyone loves. Everyone who works with athletes loves winning. Like when I was at Chelsea, I love winning titles. I love winning cups. I love being part of an organization that won. Everyone wants to win. Okay. That's one of the big reasons why we do what we do. The second reason that we do what we do is that we love seeing an athlete develop. If you were part of a journey of Joe Burrows, right, through LSU, and now see what Joe does in the NFL. If you were part of that team at LSU, you know, you would be very grateful to what you've put in to say, I've been part of that, that guy's journey. Um, but I think what's really important is looking at, can we reduce our availability stats season on season on season? Because that should be something that you should both departments should be looking at every single year. Can we reduce the amount of times that we have soft tissue injuries? Can we reduce pre-season that last year we had five hamstrings or three hamstrings can we reduce that to one and how are we going to do it how are we going to tackle that 
are we going to put a protocol that both sides, athletic trainers and strength and conditioning, are together to deliver it? And can we look back at it? And then can we then turn around and say to the coach, coach, we put this program in, in place and these are our results. And if the results aren't what you think they are, the easy way to look at that is go, well, we were just unlucky. And I just think that's bullshit, right? It's, what do you mean you're unlucky, right? It's, I mean, that's the biggest thing I've, I've heard in sport all the time. Well, we're just unlucky. Bullshit, you're unlucky. Your program isn't working. So therefore, go back to the drawing board and look at how you can tweak, change that, pro that program and then come back to the following season and then look at that data over a longitudinal period, three, four, five years. And there's been a lot of strength coaches on this podcast that will probably think, well, that's not my department. Well, I disagree with you. Of course, it's your department. Of course, the number one thing is, is the athlete available to do what they're supposed to do? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much they can bench and how much they can squat and how much high they can jump. It's irrelevant if they can't play. It's absolutely irrelevant. 